Welcome to our talk about Jupyter Hub for domain-focused integrated learning modules. Um, we are from UC Berkeley. We're going to be talking a little bit about UC Berkeley's approach to uh, open source education in, in data science, um, specifically using data hub or a Jupyter Hub instance. Um, I'm Mariah Rogers. I was a student a year ago at UC Berkeley, and since then I've been working with the Data Science Education Program as a program coordinator for the modules program, which we're going to be talking about today, and now serving as one of the first data science undergraduate major advisors. And I'm Julian Kudras, and over the past two years I've worked as a curriculum developer and as the curriculum development lead at the Division of Data Sciences. So what do we mean by a domain-focused domain integrated learning module? Well, um, our modules program helps create introductory level data science or computational techniques lessons that are integrated, fully integrated, and really anchored into the course content of existing courses on campus, many of which are non-technical in nature. Modules are designed to be completely accessible to all students. Um, and we teach them in any department, uh, any, any class, whether it's lower division, freshman level, upper division, or even graduate, and taught by any instructor. So we work with many instructors that don't know computational techniques themselves, but we work with them to develop these techniques, and we also go into the classes to present the modules alongside their instructors. So a module consists of a set of Jupyter notebooks these are taught in lecture presentations where the notebooks are usually pretty filled out, used for demonstration purposes. We do in-class lab sections where it's a lot of fill in the blank, try it yourself type challenges, uh, assignments that they'll do at home and then we'll come back for another module session or extended projects which have a relatively thin project skeleton where students can adapt some creativity on a data set of their choice throughout a semester. And all of these things are run on Berkeley's Data Hub, which is a campus-run Jupyter Hub instance that was designed for our Foundations of Data Science course, Data 8. And our modules are developed by students, primarily. So we have a team of student developers that work in small teams of three to four, led by team leads which is an advanced undergrad uh, who works directly with the faculty to design a module that relates to the course's learning goals um, and select a data set that's relevant to the course content. So I'd like to show you, before we get into more details about the modules program and the Jupyter Hub that we use, what it's like for a student in one of these modules. So imagine that you are a freshman in an introductory level English class and one day, your professor says, we have some special guests coming. And we say, you can do data science. In fact, you're going to do it right now. And this is what they would see. And short disclaimer, don't click this link, because it will only work if you have a Berkeley login. But this is what the students will do. They'll click the link, they'll be redirected, and here is the notebook. It showed up on the wrong screen. There it is. Let me do that again. Redirect. And notebook. Easy peasy. OK, sorry about that. So that's all that a student will see when we come into their class for the first time. And within moments, they're up and running with a data exploration notebook of their very own. So in this English class, we go in once in the middle of the semester, and these students have already been studying some poems for several weeks, which were written by Chinese detainees on Angel Island. And these detainees have written poetry about their struggles on the walls of the barracks where they were staying. And students have been uh, individually, manually, uh, conducting study of these poems for the themes, uh, et cetera. 
And within the span of 50 minutes, we were able to teach them basic computational techniques and demonstrate how to do computational text analysis and sentiment analysis of these poems on all 49 of the poems at once. So next I'm going to talk about the Jupiter Hub. And um, before I do that, I want to give a little bit of background about what uh, motivated us at Berkeley to make a Jupyter Hub instance for our, all of our classes. So Data8, our Foundations of Data Science course, was developed by some faculty at UC Berkeley uh, with the motivation that computation should be accessible and relevant to all students. We can't assume any computing background, and we only want to ensure that everyone has high school algebra background of mathematical maturity. Um, students will be able to interact immediately with data by writing and running code. We can't assume that everyone has a personal computer and we can't require them to figure out an installation themselves. This itself will factor into the student intimidation with computing, uh, the so-called command line tax, which we aim to mitigate with a data hub. So we've built a platform that students can build upon throughout their college careers by accessing course materials from all the courses that they've taken in one centralized location on our Berkeley Data Hub. So our Data Hub design was meant to eliminate or remove the command line tax while also making computing relevant for everyone and accessible for everyone with the ultimate goal of bringing data literacy to all students and to increase computing diversity overall. And particularly on that last green arrow there, have content that appeals to all demographics and is relevant in all domain areas is really what we focus on with our modules program. So with this design goal in mind, the faculty that designed Data8 were trying to come up with a solution that would enable cloud-based computing. And they stumbled upon the first Berkeley Jupyter Hub, which was run by an instructor on campus that created essentially a Jupyter Hub before Jupyter Hub was really a thing um, for her cognitive science course, Computational Models of Cognition. She ported the course over from MATLAB to Python and set up essentially a Jupyter Hub um, where the students could log in with first GitHub authentication and then Google authentication and run Jupyter Notebooks for her class. The Data Aid instructors completely duplicated this installation of a uh, Jupyter Hub into the first Data8 Data Hub. So this is kind of where we are now. Um, the Data Hub, I'm not going to go into too much detail about all the specific uh, architectural components of Data Hub, but focus on a few of the tools that are really essential for the modules workflow. So the authentication that was used at first on Jessica Hamrick's Cognitive Science Hub um, was with GitHub and then Google. And since then, we've been very fortunate to have a resident Jupyter Hub uh, developer, UV Panda, who's giving a talk at this very moment as well. Um, he's created O authentication through our uh, standard CalNet authentication on the Berkeley campus. So any student, any instructor, any researcher that has CalNet, works at Berkeley, goes to school at Berkeley, can log into our data hub and use the resources. And the data hub is now managed uh, on Kubernetes. So this enables powerful, scalable uh, user management, um, which abstracts away the details of the hardware or the cloud service that's being used, which makes it service agnostic. And we can scale up and move across different cloud computing uh, services as much as we want. And in fact, we do. <laughs> So Data Hub's evolved pretty much every single semester since it was first used in Data 8 in fall 2015. Um, it's gone from the uh, hardware up in the EECS department on campus to some Google Cloud clusters, to Microsoft Azure, to AWS, and back again, um, and scales up pretty rapidly every single semester as well. In fall 2018, or sorry, far, fall 2015, there are approximately 80 users on uh, the EECS hardware that I mentioned, and now in fall 2018, uh, there will be upwards of 2,500 users on our data hub, which are dynamically managed by our Kubernetes 
on Azure clusters, as you can see. We've kind of noticed that Jupyter Hubs are popping up all over the place on our campus. So there's some for a bunch of individual courses. Data 8 has one. Our upper division core data science course, Data 100, is also using one. There are some up in LBNL. There are some research clusters. And our administrative staff have a future goal of one central integrated campus hub management system, which would allow any uh, computing service, um, any set of dependencies to be completely installed and decided by the instructor of a course and managed in one central location. And the result would be an interface that students can log into, they use the hub from multiple courses, and they can select which course they want to work on, and they're suddenly in the environment that has all the relevant information and dependencies for their course. So the tools that have been really essential for the modules workflow in particular are these tools right here. So GitHub is where all of our module workshops are stored. We have open source notebook directories, which are pulled into each user's individual repo uh, with uh, interact links, which is the link that I demoed for you earlier. And that is enabled by NB Git Puller, which is an extension formerly known as NB Interact, which is actually written by a student at UC Berkeley for the uh, distribution of Data 8 materials in its pilot semester and has since been um, extensively debugged and integrated into the uh, Jupyter Hub core uh, infrastructure. NB Server Proxy is a more recent extension which has enabled more complex uh, dynamic and interactive visualizations that are not native to the standard Jupyter Notebook interface. For example, a 3D interactive brain visualization that you can click and drag. Um, and so that was the motivation, that particular use case was the motivation for this extension. And then on top of that, we have NBR session proxy, um, which was motivated by several departments on campus not wanting to give up their use of RStudio, but wanting to have the power of the data hub. So we have essentially enabled you to run a full uh, RStudio instance in the browser, just like the Jupyter Notebooks. So this is what that tiny URL that I showed you looks like underneath the tiny URL overlay. It has a basic structure. Uh, the hub URL that we're working on. The account refers directly to the organization where all of our repos are stored, so the DS modules organization in GitHub. The repo refers directly to the course that we're working on, English 31 AC. And the path field right now is empty because when I clicked that link, it took us to the top of the file directory for that repo. But if we ever wanted to teach a module where all we wanted the students to see was the notebook itself, then we would include the link to the, re, uh, to the notebook itself in the path. So Jupyter Hub enables a lot of functionality that just wouldn't be possible for our modules program. For students, they'll see a ready-to-go working environment the moment that class starts and not have to deal with any troubleshooting, um, the headache of installation, what goes wrong, different uh, operating systems, um, and not having to go out and find the files and download them into their working directory or the data sets or scripts that they might need to do their work. For the instructors and the administrators, um, Jupyter Hub enables a streamlined process of managing the users. We have dynamic load balancing that's done automatically by Kubernetes. We have shared compute and storage resources, so we don't have to worry about necessarily all of our memory being used up at one given time. Streamlined troubleshooting with administrator's panel where any administrator can debug any student or other user's kernel issues. And a consolidated and identical working environment for ed every single student so that we know they don't have necessarily a wrong version of a library. Um, and this definitely helps minimize the one-off errors. Overall, we have a streamlined experience that 
is essential, definitely essential for our modules program, which Julian's going to tell you more about in a minute. Um, so we have the centralized uh, control of library and dependency uh, installations, which is done once on the data hub, and then it's available for anyone anywhere on campus. One, or in our case, a few administrators who can have the power to break the prod. Um, and it's completely abstracted away the complications of the infrastructure from the students. So they can see exactly what they need for their class to focus on the material and nothing else. But for those who want to do a little more, it enables the use of different kernels when needed without the installation or setup headache that often comes with learning a new technology and setting it up for the first time. So now we're going to switch over, and Julian's going to tell you more about the logistics and the philosoph philosophical uh, reasons for why we do our modules program. Thanks, Mariah. So we've already touched on some of the goals of the modules program, but I'm going to talk about some of the other motivations that we have. And um, one of those is reaching students across a wide variety of majors. So there are a lot of majors on campus that don't have any sort of programming or statistics requirements. And it's important to prepare these students for a data-rich world once they do graduate. We also want to make data science accessible. So by bringing lessons to students outside of data science courses and breaking down barriers to entry, one, by making the setup much simpler, and two, by providing a lot of resources for them both inside of the classroom and outside of the classroom once the module is completed, uh, we want to make it simpler for students to get access to learning data science. We also want to encourage these students to take more data science courses. So we're doing this by showing them the value of data science in the context of their field of study. And we want to provide students with skills that are going to be relevant to their field. So we also teach these tools and these techniques in a way that they'll be able to apply them outside of this module and use these same learnings outside of just this one classroom session. So this is an overview of some of the modules that we offered during last fall. Uh, it's not a comprehensive list, but it's some of them. And I'd like to highlight a few things about this graphic. So first we can see we have quite a wide range of departments. Uh, for example, psychology, art, and linguistics. We also see a good balance of upper division courses, the 100 to 200 numbered courses, and lower division courses, which are those two-digit courses. We've also worked with a few grad courses, uh, which are these 200 plus level courses in the information and education departments. So in the past year, we've reached over 1,700 students with the modules program. This is a number that's comparable to some of Berkeley's largest classes, including our Introduction to Computer Science class, which has around 1,600 students each semester, and our Introduction to Data Science class, which has around 1,200 students in each semester. We've collaborated with over 40 courses and instructors. And like we saw, this was across a wide range of departments and upper and lower division courses. And another group that we're reaching is the curriculum developers who are building these modules. So they're getting exposure to new libraries, learning about how to build this curriculum, and getting experience working in a development team. So these are the three groups that are participating in a module. Uh, you see their role underneath each name. And along the edges of the triangle, we have the way in which they interact. So faculty and curriculum developers work together in order to produce these modules. Uh, the curriculum developers will guide students in the classroom as they work through the modules. And then both the faculty and the students are learning these data science techniques as they work through these notebooks that we've built. So how do we support people in completing their assignments? So for professors, we host a data science pedagogy workshop which is run by UC Berkeley data science professors. Uh, many, but not all, of our professors that we partner with take this pedagogy workshop. So we also provide support in the classroom from our curriculum developers to help answer questions and debug student issues. For curriculum developers, we host workshops and talks to help them learn how to teach data science, use development tools like Git, 
And we also provide them a lot of feedback on their work. So both from students via a feedback form and from the professors that they've worked with, as well as their team members. And for students outside of the classroom, we provide data science office hours for any questions that they might have completing the assignment or if they want to continue learning. We also provide them with a lot of resources, both online and on campus, to expand their data science knowledge beyond just this classroom session. So let's take a look at what these notebooks actually look like. Uh, I've got excerpts from a few different notebooks, and we're starting with this macroeconomics notebook. So it's got some background info on the course, and you'll see that it's got an introduction to the computing environment, Jupyter Notebooks. This is later on in the same notebook, and there are a few things I want to highlight here. One is that we've got a code skeleton built up, so you'll see that students are able to fill in the blank. Uh, this is one of the more introductory notebooks, but we do expect students to write more of their own code as they learn more and as they progress. You can also see that inside the code block that we've given them, we're commenting the code, explaining individual functions. So the explanations are both in the markdown and embedded in those code blocks. So this is also from this economics course. We can see how we're integrating the data science material with the course material. So after graphing some financial data, students are answering questions based on learnings of the course. And so we're not just teaching data science separately from the course material itself. These are questions that students might have been working on otherwise, on a pen and paper, on a worksheet, answering textbook questions. But now we're integrating that with a data science component as well. One more thing to note here is the last line of the notebook, which is a submission cell. So this will submit the notebook to OKPy, which we use for some of our modules. And that's an auto grader, as well as just a portal for the professor to see all the notebooks and simplify grading and feedback for them. So we can start to see why Jupyter notebooks are so well suited for teaching. Uh, we can embed explanations of material, the explanations of the problem set, and the problem set all on the same page, which is especially useful for first-time data scientists, knowing that all of the information that they need to complete the assignment is in one place, no need to search for material on different windows. It's sort of centralized. So one other module that I'd like to take a look at is from a rhetoric course. This notebook was a great example of learnings being applicable beyond the course itself. And what was happening in this module is that students were analyzing political speeches and looking at patterns in those speeches broken down by party. You can see on this chart some of the key results from the module. Um, the idea of the module is that words can be grouped into five categories in this case, uh, such as authority words or care words. And you can see that Democrats and Republicans will use words from certain categories more. So the main idea here is that students had previously been doing this analysis by hand. They had been looking at lists of words in different categories, reading through speeches themselves, and tallying up counts of words that fell into each category, which uh, the really limited the scope of text that they could process and read to just what a person can sit down and read in a single session. But with using Python and some text analysis skills, they can now analyze as many speeches as they'd like. And um, not only did we save them the trouble of reading speeches, but we taught them how to apply these techniques to other sorts of speeches, other sorts of texts. So at the end of our module, we teach them how they can change the parameters of the analysis, how they can look at maybe different dictionaries, different groups of words as well as looking at other texts like song lyrics or novels to do some sentiment analysis on those. So how do we build a module? It's really a collaborative effort. Uh, the course staff, so professors and teaching assistants, bring the domain knowledge. And the curriculum developers bring their data science skills and notebook development skills in order to create a module. Uh, a lot of the time, professors won't have a programming background. And so they're learning alongside their students as we present these materials in the course. We've also built up a lot of materials around uh, this process to streamline it. 
So we've built a lot of reusable components, such as what we saw earlier in the economics notebook. We have one general purpose introduction to Jupyter notebooks, sort of explaining the environment, what is a text cell, what is a code cell. And so that our developers don't have to continuously rebuild the same materials. So we call these core resources. And we've built them not just for introduction to Jupyter notebooks, but also for skills like text parsing and data visualization. And the idea here is that if a course wants to learn about text parsing, then we don't have to go and rebuild that whole lesson. We can just integrate a new data set that's relevant to the course work with the course staff in order to tune it to that domain, answer relevant questions, and then uh, provide that to the students. So this really streamlines the process of building a notebook for students to use in the classroom. We also have a lot of guidelines for our developers uh, to make it simpler for them to build these notebooks. So things like standardized formatting for markdown, things like heading sizes, things like style guides for their code blocks and including a link to our feedback form. So these are some of the key metrics that we got from our surveys. 70% of the students wanted to see modules in more of their courses. Uh, this is an encouraging number. Most of them found it useful and have some interest in pursuing more data science. 40% of students said they wanted to go and take data eight after doing a module. 10% um, of students had already taken data eight. And it's important to keep in mind that the majority of these students weren't on paths that require any sort of programming or data science courses. So this 40% is a really good number for students who are going to be taking this course purely out of interest. So to continue improving our program, uh, we want to continue improving the student experience. We take a lot of feedback on the difficulty of modules, the clarity of our instructions, uh, and feedback for our curriculum developers. The surveys are also anonymous, so we keep the responses honest. Um, and one other way that we've incorporated some feedback from students is hosting office hours. So initially, we didn't have an office hours program. But after a lot of our students wanted to ask more questions outside of class, we began hosting data science specific office hours for each module that we offer. Uh, we also want to continue expanding our offerings on campus. So bringing data science modules to any course we can provide value in and encourage more students to study data science, both as its own field and in conjunction with their interests that they have already. Uh, one of the recent things that we've added is a program called Data Peers, which is a drop-in advising session where students can get help on their own data science research projects that they may be doing outside of class. So we're hoping that students will be inspired by their module to work on more data science related questions outside of the classroom. And this is one of the things that we provide to support them. So if you're interested in looking at some more notebooks, or uh, learning more about data science in Berkeley in general, I'd recommend you check out some of these websites. And thank you all for attending. We got about five minutes for questions. Thanks. On one slide, you had one gigabyte per user. Was that RAM? Uh, that is, yeah, compute memory as well as, I believe it's around one gigabyte of persistent storage for each student at the moment. Okay. So and a then, gigabyte of each. And then how much, how many um, IT people does it take to run all this? Good question. <laughs> well, we have one uh, really amazing developer, UV Panda, who's one of the core contributors to the Jupyter project. Um, he basically designed and maintains our data hub, um, but we have a few other administrators and other departments around campus, um, like statistics and computer science, who help out with the administration, as well as some Division of Data Sciences staff members who take on the uh, administrative uh, debugging of student kernels, and that includes some of the UGSI, the undergraduate uh, student instructors for the undergraduate data science courses, as well as our modules program staff. Thank you.
So I'm curious what kind of feedback you're getting from the 30% of students who don't want to see more of these modules. Like, is it of the form, I like the concept, but the logistics aren't quite there? Or is it more fundamental, like, I didn't sign up this for this course to program, and I don't want to see any more statistics in here. I, I signed up to learn about poetry or something. Like, what kind of feedback are you getting? Right, so a lot of the students who don't want to see more modules also listed modules as being very difficult. So we find that that might be a problem with our material not being taught at the right level. Um, we integrate it really closely with the course material, so I don't think it's a huge problem with students saying, I don't want to learn this, I don't want to look at this, because it is, it is tightly connected with what students are learning already. But yeah, so it's, uh, it's about um, fine-tuning the difficulty of the module. Some students uh, thought the module went on too long, maybe too many class sessions, things along those lines. <laughs> To add on that, a few, we basically get feedback on both of those veins that you've mentioned. Um, some students think it's too easy or too slow um, because it is geared towards that introductory level. And of course, in every English class, there must be at least a few computer science students. Um, <laughs> just kidding, but <laughs> in some cases, that's, that's how it ends up working out. Um, and in other cases, they think it's too fast or too hard, and they just simply don't want to do it. But we are hoping that having it more widely available, uh, and that'll help make it a little less taboo, a little less intimidating, in the hopes that people will kind of overcome those fears and, and gain data literacy. Uh, thank you both for your uh, really great talk. I, I really appreciated your time. Um, you've talked about the command line tax and also about abstracting the need to control environments from the students. Um, but you also talked about future goals of allowing professors and instructors to create bespoke environments for their course. So as an example, say I'm a student, um, I don't have a high degree of technological literacy, um, and I'm in a couple of courses that take advantage of the data hub. Um, say I learn a function in one course, and I want to apply that to a problem that I encounter in another course. But the instructors have different versions of that package, and um, all of a sudden that function doesn't work the way that I expected it to, the way that I learned that it does work. Um, is this just shifting the, the tax from the command line to an import line? Um, well, as we've mentioned that right now all of our modules and connector courses all work on the same data hub that Data8 does. So for the most part, it's centralized and contained in that way. Um, and I don't know too much of the specifics of how the different hubs would work for the courses um, in the future goals. Um, that was you know, described to me by our system administrators as what they're working towards. Um, but I would hope that it would still maintain some of the connectivity that it's got right now in one centralized hub where they all kind of work together and perhaps are still maintained in the same way, but maybe run on separated clusters um, or have just an interface differentiation where the students don't see all the other stuff for their other courses when they're trying to focus on their psychology course. Have you guys planned to implement high availability for JupyterHub? Can you repeat the question? Do you guys plan to implement high availability for JupyterHub, like horizontally scaling the instance? Yeah, so we've had uh, up to 500 users at a time. Um, we think we could handle more, so it is auto-scaling. Uh, but in terms of high availability, yeah, we have some courses like Data8, which have up to 1,200 students who might access all at once, as well as all of these other courses who are using their own data hubs. Um, we also have separate hubs for different uh, courses and different um, departments on campus. So for example, our business school has their own data hub, um, and the data A class has their own data hub, and so on. Thanks for a great talk. It's great to see everything that you're doing here. Um, you mentioned the sort of standard notebooks where you take out one data set and put in another data set, as well as the guidelines for instructors. Are those things that are publicly available? Uh, yeah, so if you want to take a look at our GitHub, um, you'll see some of our notebooks. And if you, this is the uh, link to the GitHub site. But if you look at our actual repo, you'll see also some of our core resources. 
Um, most of our materials are there, not all of them, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes we don't want to release solutions onto the GitHub yet so that students don't just look at our repos. Uh, but you will find some of those resources there. And in general, we are working toward making them all more open. Please give me a round of applause for, to our speakers.